So we're giving grace and we're talking about a God of vengeance. And you might think, you know, that sounds a little bit funny uh, of a topic for giving grace, right? Vengeance and, you know, being gracious, they're kind of like the opposite of each other. So um, that's, that's true. But I think you'll start to see how this comes together tonight. So hopefully um, the title doesn't make you think that we're going to be just talking about like intensity, vengefulness, and all of those kind of things tonight. It, it actually, I hope, will be, you know, the beginning of something encouraging and helpful, but something that, you know, gets you to think about stuff. I actually want to start, um, I don't do this often. I normally don't tell stories, but I'm actually going to start with a story. So uh, I started studying this about a year and a half ago. This topic is a, a year and a half old for me, so it's you know relatively new as far as that kind of thing goes. And I started studying it because um, I realized I had an anger issue. That probably sounds you know really serious. Maybe it was, but uh, I realized you know I got angry and frustrated a lot. So uh, let me tell you about this. Um, every every year every couple of years, our family drives across the United States. And we do that because my in-laws live in Virginia. So we're in California, we drive to Virginia and we drive back. It's long, it's a, it's a 40 hour trip. So, you know, 40 hours in a car gives you a lot of opportunity to get frustrated about a lot of things <laughs> so, and about things that really don't actually matter. So in Kansas City, I remember specifically, this was in Kansas City, we were driving to Kansas City and um, the goal was for us to get there before 5 p.m. Now, that wasn't just a goal that I had made up. Here was the reason. You know, I felt like at the time this was extremely important. Uh, 5 p.m. was when the hotel we were staying at stopped serving complimentary dinner, right? Now, we have four children, so there's six of us. And I was thinking, wow, like, can you believe this? free dinner for six people. Like, that's going to be awesome. It's going to save us all this money. It's going to be great. We have to get there before five. So, you know, it was really, really a big thing in my mind. Get there before five, get there before five. And as it turns out, we got there. You ready? I, I remember this. We got there at 5.07. And, and I couldn't believe it. And I was so mad. I just, you know, I didn't want to talk to anybody for like a long time. You know, it, it the amount that I was angry was not proportional to the fact that we missed our complimentary dinner. That really was not hugely important. Okay. So I was very frustrated. And I remember that night thinking, wow, like, why was I so mad about free dinner? You know, at the most, right? Like these hotels, they don't serve like nice dinners. They're like, you know, chips. <laughs> it's how you get like chips and salsa or something like that. So, you know, it wasn't like we actually saved a lot of money anyway, or we would have saved a lot of money. And so I couldn't figure out, you know, why was I so frustrated about this? And, and it came to me like, maybe, maybe I'm just getting angry about things that aren't actually important. Maybe I actually struggle with being angry, like an angry kind of person. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to make a goal tonight. I am not going to get angry for 24 hours. And, you know, we'll see how that goes. So go to bed, get in the car the next day. We're going to drive somewhere else. I don't remember, Colorado, something like that. And, and we get in the car and we're driving and it's lunchtime and we're trying to decide where to go. So I said to the kids, where do you want to eat? We have these two different restaurants, right? Where would you like to stop? And the kids couldn't agree. You know, they started arguing. And I, surprise, got angry. <laughs> And I said, you know, why can't you decide on a place to eat? Like, this isn't that hard. Just decide where you want to eat. And then I realized, ah, I got angry again, right? Like, this wasn't even 24 hours. And both times, you know, it was about food. I don't know if there was something, you know, some kind of weird connection there with that. But, but it was this weird realization for me that, you know, I am, I am getting angry about things that actually don't matter at all, you know, in any regard. And so I thought, this seems like, and I, can, and I can't even not get angry for 24 hours, right? So I thought this seems like something that I need to have a little bit of biblical guidance on. So this is why, that's, this is the genesis of this study, giving grace. So it's really a look at judgment and anger 
And you might wonder, you know, how judgment connects to this, but I think it's very much judgment is something that is very much connected to anger for us. So here's the plan. We want to remove our excuses for judgment and anger. Right? That's what we're going to spend our time doing uh, this weekend to try and get rid of those excuses and inspire ourselves to completely put away anger and stop judging. Now, I recognize, you know, we're not going to be perfect, but hopefully, hopefully after this, you know, if you struggle like I did with not getting angry in a 24 hour period, hopefully this will help you and inspire you. So that's the goal. So we're going to talk about a God of vengeance tonight. Tomorrow, we are going to discuss meekness and how this goes together. Meekness. We're going to spend some time on the Sermon on the Mount after that. So this is uh, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So that'll be um, the second class on Saturday. Our Sunday school class is going to be about judging and idolatry. And that's still in Matthew, uh, in Matthew but it's now Matthew chapter 7. Right, so we're kind of moving through the Sermon on the Mount. So this is Matthew seven, with um, the parable of the moat and the beam. So we'll talk about that in the class on Sunday, and then we are, we'll talk about dogs, swine, and trees. And you might think that's a really random topic, but that also comes from Matthew seven, when Jesus says, "Do not cast your pearls before the dogs, right, uh, or the swine." And then he says, you know. Beware of false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits, right? So you know, the dogs, the swine, the trees. And I also just really thought that's like one of the most awesome pictures of cute little pigs. And I wanted to put that up there. So there you go. Okay, so that's the plan for the weekend in what we're going to be looking at in terms of judgment and anger. So here we are in class number one. Uh, if, you've, if you've heard my classes before, one of the things that you will perhaps remember is I feel like it's really important to have a central or core message in every class. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's my, my uh, belief in uh, the amount of holes that we have in our, in our memory, <laughs> but, but I really like to have a central message um, that you know, can be the main thing that you remember about a class. So for this weekend, this is the main message of each class. So for tonight, the main message is that judging is a part of God's character. And, you know, we'll review these in each class. So that's going to be the main message of tonight. For tomorrow, what we want to see is that judging should not be part of our character. Then that judging should be replaced with humility. So it's part of God's character, not part of ours. And so the way that we deal with that is by replacing it with humility. Because, this is now what Sunday is about, because judging is actually legalism and idolatry. So I'm going to come out on judging, you know, pretty hard. Uh, but I, I hope scripturally to prove this. Judging is legalism and idolatry. And this is a serious one, right? Legalism and idolatry basically means... That when you judge, you declare that you are not following Christ. So that's uh, a very interesting one. But I think that the Lord Jesus actually says that to his disciples. So we will take a look at that. Um, and we're, you know, we're going to define what judging means. We're going to see uh, what things do we judge, what things do we not judge. Uh, and I think it will inspire us to really put certain types of judging away from our lives. So there you go. We have some guiding principles. Now, these are things that I just think are, are hugely important for any Bible study. We want to notice that scripture gives details, right? We don't want to just gloss over verses and say, oh, you know, yeah, I already know what those mean. We want to look at the details and ask, you know, why are these there? So that's something. <laughs> and the second thing is when you notice the details, you ask why, right? This is, this is one of my favorite John Thomas quotes. Um, I think it really encapsulates who we are as Christadelphians. And that's why I love it so much. He says, investigate everything you believe. If it is the truth, it cannot be injured thereby. If error, the sooner it is corrected, the better. Okay. So he says, you know, ask questions about everything. You know, don't, if, if what you believe is right, well, asking questions then isn't going to cause any problems, right? So we shouldn't be afraid of questions. And so that's what he goes on to say, never be afraid of results to which you may be driven by your investigations. 
as this will inevitably bias your mind and disqualify you to arrive at ultimate truth. So he says, don't be afraid of asking the questions. Don't be afraid of where you're going to end up when you ask the questions. Ask them and recognize that by asking these questions, you will find what's true. And keep asking. So we're really going to be asking why. And then we're going to see that scripture must be understood in its context. So those are kind of our main principles of exposition here. If you want, you could call this, you know, our methodology. <laughs> so that's kind of what we're going to be um, taking a look at as we go through these passages in these five classes. All right. So let's kind of start to put this together. Let's, let's introduce this topic tonight of a God of vengeance. Now, uh, perhaps you haven't noticed this lately because you know i know that <laughs> it's been kind of hard for us to see each other over the last year and few months so maybe you haven't noticed that interactions with each other are sometimes frustrating um but you know maybe you can think back about a year ago or so and you might remember that there are instances where you find yourself getting really upset with other people in the ecclesia right well I want us to think about why. Why is it that we can get frustrated with other people? I think sometimes we ask the question, right? Do they care? We look at somebody else and we say, oh, you know what? They're doing that or they're making that statement because they think they're holier than I am. Or they think that what they're doing is more righteous than what I do, right? Or maybe we have the other issue, right? We don't feel like people are judging us Maybe instead we're judging other people, right? We get this thought of, oh, do you see what that person's wearing? Or, you know, did you see how they just dealt with the situation? Ha, well, they're, they're obviously just losers and they can't get it together. Um, you know, if you don't ever think either of these kind of thoughts, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, I, am, I am glad for you. But I think probably these are thoughts that pass through our mind significantly more frequently than we would want them to. So I think these are some of the reasons why we get frustrated in ecclesial life. You know, we maybe want to make something happen. Somebody says, well, I don't want that to happen. And then we start thinking, oh, well, they think they're better than I am. They think they're holier than me, something like that. Right. And so then maybe we start to distance ourselves from other people. Oh, well, you know, that person is like that. So I don't, you know, I don't really need to talk to them anymore. Right. I know how they are. However, Religion is not just between us and God, and I think that that's crucial, right? Think, think to the story. Think about what the Lord Jesus says for when he returns. So I have the verses up there, Matthew 25, 34 to 40. He says, the Son of Man will come and he'll sit on his throne and he'll gather all nations, right? And he'll divide them between the sheep and the goats. Do you remember what he says? to the sheep and to the goats. There's that, that crucial line here. He says, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You remember that, right? He says, he says to the sheep, you know, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me, right? He says all these things. And they say, well, when did we do that? And Jesus says, well, when you did it to my brethren, you did it to me. And so this shows us, I think, right? The way that we're going to be judged is not based off of, you know, what was our, the strength of our relationship with God, but it's not just that. It's how was that relationship with God reflected in our interactions with each other? So our interactions with one another are huge for determining, do we walk to the right or the left? We can't just say, oh, well, you know, it's between me and God. I dealt with those people already. They're losers. I know how they are. The end. Right? Or they all think they're holier than I am. That's it. We can't do that. 1 Corinthians 12, you know, this is where the Apostle Paul talks about how we are a body, right? And that when one member suffers, he says, all the members suffer with it. Now, you can't do that unless you have a relationship with other people. And so I think what happens is anger and judgment they are these feelings that tend to make us want to isolate ourselves from other people, and yet we can't do that. So we have to learn to work together. And I think the key to this 
is learning to give grace. And that comes from Ephesians 4.29. You can turn there if you want. Uh, but this is, this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says that we must give grace, giving grace to one another. So that's where the title comes from for the series. And so that's what we're really going to be considering. How do we give grace to each other? And I'm coming at it, I guess, from a negative aspect in terms of considering, you know, this aspect of judging. This is something that we struggle with that I think if we can get rid of that, that's really going to help us to give grace to one another. So that's what we're going to be working on this weekend. We want to try and remove judging from our lives so that we can give grace. Now, before we can do that, though, we have to get rid of, I called it a pervasive myth here. Now, that, that, you know, that sounds a little intense. I think this is perhaps, you know, a, a fallacy, right? A flaw in our thinking. Uh, and maybe you've never thought this way. But this was definitely a flaw in mine for years and years before, um, before I did this study. And what I mean by that is, I think sometimes we give ourselves excuses to become angry or to judge other people. Now, I, I think that that's, you know, that's what justification is all about, right? We love to justify ourselves. But I think that what I'm talking about is a little more insidious than just justifying. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, when Ruth and I were engaged, so this is like 11 years ago or so, uh, she was teaching at, at the Heritage School, which is where I work now. She was teaching at the Heritage School, and, and there was a sister from Canada who had come down to help us um, learn how to teach so that she was like an expert in the field of education and so she wanted to come down and teach our teachers how to teach so she was staying with Ruth right and um at that time <laughs> when I was in my early 20s I I thought that one of the most exciting things was to go to other churches and argue with them about doctrine you know I thought that was like that was something that you could do to you know really serve the Lord and it was really awesome uh, and I don't, I don't mean, you know, trying to just persuade people. I mean, like going and arguing and just, and, <laughs> and just trying to make people feel like, you know, they didn't actually know anything. It wasn't really a real good thing. So, so I went to the local mega church out here and um, I met with the, the dean of something or other, the dean of education in their, in their college. And we had this discussion. And when I came out, there was a guy there who was training for seminary. And um, I had known him because uh, we happened to be co-workers. And so he saw me and he said, hey, have you, uh, have you considered this verse in relation to the Trinity? Right? And he talked about Genesis 1 where it says, let us make man in our image. And I was like, yes, I have. And, and you know, I talked about it and all that. And he got really upset. And his response was, you know what? You're going to hell. And I was like, whoa, whoa, dude. Uh, that, you know, that was a little intense. And he was like, nope, you're going to hell. And he like backed away from me, right? And, and then he left. Okay, so I decided to go to Ruth's house. So I went to her house to tell her about, you know, how frustrated I was with this whole thing. And I was like, you know, I'm going to hell. Like, I don't even believe that hell is like a scary place. We're all going there, right? And I, you know, I was mad. And so this sister who was who had come to help out at the school right she heard this whole thing about me being frustrated with this guy and how he condemned me to hell and all these things and uh and she heard this and when i was done talking i like went into another room and she went to ruth and she said did you know um jason seems very angry seems like he uh, needs to work on that and I was in another room, but I actually heard her say that. <laughs> so I came out and I said, no, you know what? Like, I should be angry. I should be angry because if you look, and I was like, ha, like, how is she going to argue with this? And I said, if you look at Acts chapter 15, you will see that when Paul debated with the Judaizers about whether or not Gentiles should be circumcised, it says he had no small dissension with them. Now, to have no small dissension, you have to be, you know, riled up about things. And I was like, so there you go, Acts 15, Paul did it. And I walked away, right, being like, ha, take that. <laughs> Which, I, I want to make this very clear. She was right. 
Okay, then there you go. She was right. So after that, I continued to think, you know, Paul had no small dissension. You know, I, I thought this was a great passage, Acts 15, like it shows us, right? Paul had no small dissension. The man born blind, you know, in John chapter nine, says things like, oh, do you also want to be his disciple, right? And I thought, yeah, like, I mean, we should get mad. We should like make fun of him. That's what we should be doing. And uh, it took me a long time to realize that this was the fallacy that I was holding on to. There were passages in scripture that made it sound like anger and judgment were okay. And I had been holding on to those passages to justify my anger. So like, this isn't just justifying because, oh, well, they did this. This is justifying with biblical passages. And, you know, I think sometimes we do this, right? We say, oh, well, the Bible supports this when really it doesn't. And so that's what we are going to be looking at tonight. So a God of vengeance, this whole idea is we want to talk about what do we do with these passages that seem to show anger is something that's okay. You know, is it okay? What's actually going on here? So what we're going to do in the rest of our time, here's our outline. We're going to talk about the imprecatory Psalms. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before. It was new to me uh, when I was going through this study. Um, and we'll, we'll get into what they are, but basically that the Psalms um, of curses. So like Psalm 58 that we read, the imprecatory Psalms. Then we're going to talk about the significance of these Psalms. So that's the plan to remind you of the core message. We're going to see that judging is part of God's character. And we're going to ask why, right? That's one of our, our key principles here of our methodology. The why question we want to ask is why are some of the Psalms filled with such destructive thoughts? You know, just consider that for a while. We just read a psalm that says, let my enemies melt like snails. I mean, that, that was like great justification for me. You know, that guy says, I'm going to go to hell. Well, fine. You know, you'll melt like a snail. So like, you know, that that's uh, seemed like, here, I'll quote the Bible at you, right? Like, this is totally legitimate for me. And yet, I don't think it is. But the question then is, well, if it's not okay for us to say those things, then why are they there? right? What's it mean? All right, so let's talk about imprecatory psalm. So imprecatory is a big word, which basically means uh, curses, right? So an imprecatory, well, an imp to be real specific, you know, if grammar is very important to you, an imprecation is a curse. So there's your, your noun form. Imprecatory is the adjective. So your imprecatory psalms are the psalms of cursing, right? So they are the, the Psalms that call down curses on other people. Let them melt like snails, right? Let their whole house be uninhabited. You know, let all these bad things happen to them. Okay, so we wanna talk about those Psalms for a little bit as we look at judging and anger, because really until we remove this attitude, until we remove this justification, I don't think we can work on judging and anger. So these Psalms are kind of difficult. Because scripture tells us to love our neighbor, right? That's the second greatest commandment. And yet these Psalms really don't seem to show that. Let's just take a look at some of these. Ready? This is Psalm 21. It says, for the king trusteth in the Lord. Just look for the imprecation here. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. Now, <laughs> that got imprecatious, <laughs> imprecatory real quickly, right? I mean, the, thou shalt make them as a fiery oven. The Lord shall swallow them up in wrath, and the fire shall devour them, right? Can you imagine? Like praying that about somebody, you know, this, oh, this guy is standing in my way in the ecclesia, like it's frustrating me. So make him catch on fire, right? Whoa, that's, <laughs> that's serious. So that is an imprecation. That's an example of an imprecatory Psalm. Here's another one. Psalm 40 verses 13 to 15. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, 
make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. So, you know, ashamed and confounded, right? Then it goes on. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a, a reward of their shame that say unto me, aha, aha. So there you go again. Let them be desolate. So these are intense prayers. Now, Psalm 58 is really one of the most intense of these, just in terms of what it prays for, right? But I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think we have to deal with these imprecatory psalms because otherwise you look at it and you think, well, maybe I should pray things like this. Right? Isn't this biblical? And yet that creates such a weird um, cognitive dissonance, right? It doesn't like fit with how do we love our neighbor and yet pray these kind of things. So look at this. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord, right? Like smash out their teeth? Like, whoa, that, I mean, if I knew, like, somebody in the ecclesia was praying that God would smash out my teeth, right, I think I'd be a little scared of that person. So it says, let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman that they may not see the sun. Now, I don't know if you were like this. This is, I thought this was fun as a kid. Maybe I was, you know, a little sadistic as a child. Uh, I used to think it was really fun to take salt and find all the snails that I could in our yard and dump salt on them and watch them bubble. I don't do that anymore, okay? I, I, you know, in addition to working on anger and judgment, I've also worked on throwing salt on snails. So I don't do that, okay? So... You know, I, the goal is for us to continually become better people. So, but, you know, think about that, right? Like the snails that bubble up when you throw salt on them and then die. That's what David is praying will happen to his enemies, right? He doesn't just say, you know, make them go away, right? Or make them stop. But he says, melt them like a snail, Then he goes even further, right? I, I mean, I don't know if you felt uncomfortable when we were reading this, because it's one of those psalms where you read it and you're like, whew, man, don't know what to do with that. So, so Psalm 58, 10, 11, he says, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So the man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judges in the earth. So not only like, is he asking, God, please melt my enemies like snails. But he says, and when that happens, who man, I'm going to be there, right? And I'm going to say, yes, God destroyed my enemy like a snail. Okay. Now, what's weird about this is he doesn't only just pray for their, like, physical destruction, but he even takes it further, praying for their spiritual destruction. So look at this. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath. Let the stranger spoil his labor. And now look at this. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Right? So he says like, and by the way, don't even be merciful to him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted. You know, you can see how this is like building, right? So first of all, he says, let his children be fatherless. Then he says, and when they're fatherless, let nobody take any pity on them. And then, not only that, cut them off too, right? Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, right? Don't forget what they've done. Don't forgive. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Wowie. Now, if you want to have justification for being angry, 
And you want to be able to say, oh, you know, that, that person, the ecclesia, man, they got in my way. They're doing all these things that I don't want to have happen. Like, oh, they bother me so much. It's one of those things where, you know, you can turn up to Psalm 58 and be like, well, that's what David prayed. You can turn to Psalm 109 and say, well, that's what David prayed, right? And he was a man after God's own heart. And it's very easy to justify these thoughts, to pray, you know, oh, let maybe something bad will happen to them so that they won't cause problems for me, right? Now, I, I just, I want to put out a disclaimer here. I don't pray these things, okay? <laughs> so, so if you're sitting there thinking like, oh man, I better never get in Jason's way because, you know, if I make him mad, he's going to be praying that I melt like a snail. Uh, I, I don't do that, okay? The goal of this class is for us to realize we can't do these things. Okay, so that's what we're getting to. But I think this can become easy justification for us. At the same time, you know, if you're not one of those people that tries to justify um, that kind of anger with people, you might look at that and be like, whoa, this is in the Bible? <laughs> like, what? And so I think what we really have to do is ask ourselves, what do we do with this? Like, why is this here? You know, how does this fit? So I think it's very interesting to go through and just look at, well, how do people deal with these psalms? So how do people deal with the imprecatory psalms? Well, this is an article I found uh, about the imprecatory psalms, um, just in, you know, a, an expository, it's in a, an academic um, Christian publication, right? This is not Christadelphian. I don't normally read non-Christadelphian stuff, but I wanted to just give you a sense of the fact that, um, all Christians wrestle with this. And I want you to see some of the solutions they've come up with. Now, notice my slide says solutions with a question mark, right? This is not a good solution. <laughs> so this is what this guy says. He says, this article was pro partly prompted by my witnessing a long embarrassed silence amongst a small group of evangelical clergy after we had read together one of the imprecatory Psalms at a prayer meeting. <laughs> right, awkward place to read that. The silence reflected the current reluctance to accept such passages for use in either private or public worship. A brief study of the Church of England's alternative service book shows us that the vast majority of imprecations within the Psalms are placed in square brackets and may therefore be omitted. Oops, there. Both Psalm 58 in its entirety, that's the melt like snail one, right? and a significant proportion of 109 are also bracketed, which may cause them never to be said in the two year cycle. So what he's saying is, right, the Church of England, you know, has, has their plan for their service and, you know, what you read the different times. He says, these are in brackets, these Psalms, telling the person who's organizing the service, and by the way, you can just skip those because these Psalms are a little awkward, right? So they, the, the Church of England basically just says, we don't know what to do with these, so we're just gonna act like they don't exist. You know, that would be like, oh, man, we got to read Psalm 58. Like, that's our second daily reading. Whew. Well, we'll just read a different chapter today, right? Okay, this is from the Word Biblical Commentary, um, which is, I, I think it's a quite, um, it's, it's a decent commentary sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, but you can, you can see where he goes with this, right? And why I would say it's, sometimes decent. So here's what Peter Craigie says about the Psalms. He says, these Psalms are not the oracles of God, right? Uh, already, you know, that shows us, huh? Yeah, we don't really agree with these commentaries. They are Israel's response to God's revelation emerging from the painful realities of human life. And thus they open a window into the soul of the psalmist. So what he's saying is these prayers to destroy my enemies, he says, this is just, you know, David's feelings because of the hard reality. So they're not necessarily inspired. So like part of the Psalm is inspired, but this part's not. Expressions of vindictiveness and hatred are not purified or holy simply by virtue of being present in scripture, right? So <laughs> this, this is the argument that, well, you know, just as like some people say, the story of Esther is the story about a woman who, you know, saved the Jews and was good, or the story of Esther 
conversely, some people say, is the story about a woman who wasn't doing what she was supposed to. It's a story about, you know, the, the Jews not trusting in God and God saving them still. Some people take it that way. This guy would say, well, you know, you could do the same thing. It's in scripture, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing, right? That's what he's arguing. So they're not the oracles of God. This is not inspired behavior, he's saying, which again, you know, you can't do that. I don't think, I don't think you can be like, well, this part makes sense. So it's inspired. This part doesn't make sense. So it's not, it doesn't work. Now, this is actually from a Christadelphian magazine. This is from the Endeavor magazine. Um, and uh, <laughs> take a look at what it wrote here. Every devout reader senses that the spirit of Christ does not pervade the Old Testament to the extent that it does the new, right? And I read that and I was like, uh, I guess I'm not a devout reader because, you know, I really don't agree with that. But, but, you know, I don't think you can say, oh, well, it, the New Testament is obviously, you know, more, it's better than the Old Testament. I, I, we can't do that. You know, scripture is inspired by God. And it is all profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, right? We, we can't say that one has the spirit of Christ in it more than the other one. Okay, so sorry, Wilfred Lambert, I really disagree with you. So the question then is, okay, so what do we do then with these things? Like, what do we do with these imprecatory psalms? There's a snail for you. Um, so... It becomes, this problem really compounds, I think, when we take a look at how many imprecatory psalms there are. So there you go. There's a total of 18. Um, 18 psalms that call down curses on their enemies. Now, you might find it interesting. Psalm 69 and 109 are considered the most imprecatory. They have, like, huge chunks that are dedicated to, like, you know, destroying enemies versus just a verse or two. Now... If you think about it like this, that there's 150 psalms in all, and there's 18 imprecatory psalms, that means that these psalms form over 10% of the book of Psalms. So, you know, Peter Craigie in the Word Biblical Commentary, where he says, well, these parts aren't the oracles of God, he just threw out 10% of psalms, right? You can't do that. So we have to figure out some kind of way. We can't just pretend like they don't exist, like the Church of England. We can't say they're less inspired than other passages, you know, we have to figure out, like, what are these things? And to take it even further, right, these were used in ancient Israel's worship, like, as part of the Psalter. So Israel would have been singing things like, let my enemies melt like snails, you know, whatever it would have been, like, they would have been singing that. And, and so that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. These can't just be ignored, like, these were a big part of ancient Israel. So that's one thing. Now, let's just deal a little bit with this progressive revelation, right? This idea that, uh, you know, well, maybe there are things that people in the Old Testament just didn't know, and now people in the New Testament know. Um, some people will deal with this, these psalms by saying that, well, you know, David was just angry about this because he didn't know that, you know, that that wasn't God's way. Well, I don't think that really works. Um, there are certain things that are progressive revelation, right? Like Abraham, we're told, had the gospel preached to him and he saw Christ's day. But I'm sure that there were details, right, that, that were revealed through the prophets that Abraham just would never have guessed, right? There is such a thing as progressive revelation. But there isn't such a thing as progressive revelation when it comes to God's principles. So when we're talking about, you know, should we pray that our enemies should melt like snails? Uh, we can't say, well, it was okay for David back then because, you know, he just didn't know. And it's not okay for us. We can't say that. God's principles never change, right? The, the way that he teaches the principles, those change sometimes. You know, sometimes it's the law. Sometimes it becomes uh, through the Lord Jesus, right? But the principles themselves never change. Okay. So here's the next thing I want to bring out. We also can't just say, well, it's really not that important. You know, I already said that it's 10% of Psalms. But in addition to that, I don't know if you have seen this before. The New Testament actually quotes these Psalms over and over. So look at this. Romans 3.13 quotes an imprecatory Psalm. It says, their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used to see. 
The poison of asps is under their lips. That's a quotation of Psalm 5, verse 9. There you go. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. So Paul, who wrote Romans, clearly believed that Romans or that Psalm 5, verse 9 was inspired. So, you know, I think we can see with this intertextuality, right, by comparing the New Testament and the Old Testament, we can see, okay, yeah, I can't just write these off. I have to acknowledge these are inspired. Okay, so there you go. Now, if you consider the next verse, right, of Psalm 5, it gets even more imprecatory, right? Destroy thou them, O God, let them fall by their own counsels, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Here's another one in Romans, Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There you go. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. And did you know that this psalm that Paul is quoting, Psalm 143, happens to close with the wor these words. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies, and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. Right? So Paul clearly believed that Psalm 143 was inspired by God. And that psalm prays that God will destroy all of David's enemies. Okay. So the Apostle Paul seems to endorse this, right? He doesn't say, you know, oh, and, and by the way, you know, I'm quoting this part of the psalm, but the other part, not good, right? He doesn't say that. Like, you know, the Apostle Paul quotes the psalm, recognizing that this psalm is the inspired word of God. Now, here's what's really interesting, I think. It's more than Paul who uses these psalms. In fact, Jesus uses them quite frequently. So take a look. Jesus says in his parable, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Sorry, this wasn't a parable. This is when he says, um, you'll say to me, Lord, Lord, did not we do you know, wonderful things in your name? Well, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Check it out. That's a quotation from Psalm 6, verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Quotation from Psalm 6. Well, guess what Psalm 6 is? Psalm 6 is an imprecatory psalm which is also quoted by Jesus in the Gospel of John. Here's how it ends. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. So there you go again. Here's this imprecatory psalm that Jesus quotes three times. Now, I, I have the Greek up there. I don't know, you know if any of you read Greek. But if you don't, by the way, I do Greek classes every week. <laughs> so, so you're welcome to join them. Now, uh, if... If you don't read the Greek, basically what this shows is that this is essentially a word-for-word -word quotation. These two words here are slightly different, same root word, different tense. So Christ actually quotes this, notice this, about himself, right? He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. He takes Psalm 6 and he applies it to himself. So that then creates another interesting piece because not only does jesus say that the psalms are inspired jesus seems to say oh and these imprecatory psalms are messianic so here's another quotation blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth right that's a quotation of psalm 37 verse 11 here's the verses that immediately follow in psalm 37 the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bow shall be broken, right? Okay, so you get the idea. I'll, I'll put this one up so you can get it for your notes if you want. But like the New Testament shows us not only are these psalms inspired, but these psalms are actually messianic psalms. In other words, the imprecatory psalms clearly cannot be removed from scripture, right? Because nothing can. They clearly, you know, can't be said, oh, they're not inspired. Because <laughs> like, even if you wanted to say pieces of scripture weren't inspired, which obviously isn't right, uh, the New Testament quotes them, right? So it shows that no, these are inspired. And not only that, but we're now being told and these psalms are actually about the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, 
what I think is the most interesting is notice the psalm that's being applied to the Lord. It's Psalm 69. Now, do you remember what the two most imprecatory psalms were? They were Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. Now get this, Psalm 69 here is definitely applied to Jesus, right? Here's more. I mean, it's, it's not only applied to Jesus like once, twice, it's applied a whole bunch of times to Jesus. So the most imprecatory psalm, the most vicious psalm, is about Jesus. It's about the Lord, right? Four different parts of the psalm are quoted about him. Now, okay. Now the other one, the other super imprecatory psalm was Psalm 109, right? Well, here you go. Guess what? That's also quoted about the Lord Jesus. So here is the interesting twist, plot twist at the end of this class. So the interesting plot twist here is that if we say these psalms, right? If we say, may my enemy melt like a snail is unchristlike. That's just not true. Because these intensely, uh, uh, these intensely fiery psalms are quoted about the Lord Jesus, particularly Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, the most imprecatory psalms. So to say, oh, well, you know, these just aren't Christ-like. These don't have the spirit of Christ in them, right? Which is what that article had said. That's just totally not biblical. Because scripture clearly shows, no, these are the spirit of Christ. Like, this is what Christ thought. So, I mean, if we really want to be biblical, like, I think we have to say, well, no, actually, the opposite of this is true. These curses are Christ-like. Now, I want to be very careful here. Please, please, please don't start, you know, praying, like, I hope this guy's hair catches on fire or whatever, because, you know, Jason said that, that praying like that is Christ-like. Okay, let's make this clear. It's Christ-like, yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we can do. Now, I think that we can reinforce this, right? We, we often associate Christ with love and comfort, but I mean, that's not always what he was, right? Matthew 25, 41, it says, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. That's pretty serious. Like, you know, I, I don't want to go into everlasting fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 to 9, says the same kind of thing. Everlasting destruction, right? The Lord Jesus in flaming fire will take vengeance on them that know not God. So, I mean, you really do see that this is, in some cases, the attitude of the Lord Jesus. You know, in, in Revelation, these are the Lord's words, right, that he gave to his angel to give unto his servant John. He says, reward her even as she has rewarded you, double unto her, double according to her work. So do twice as bad to her as what she's done. That's serious. Death, mourning, famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire. So, This kind of study can perhaps be uncomfortable because usually, you know, when we look at something, we like to read about love. We like to read about faithfulness, kindness, right? And we, we like to leave thinking, wow, you know, I'm so inspired to be a nicer person tonight. And, you know, you might not feel that way after this. But I think what we've done is laid the foundation to say, well, these Psalms are in scripture. These psalms express sentiments that are Christ-like. So, how should we understand that, and how does that apply to us? We've now laid the foundation to start asking these questions. You know, we don't want to know half of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We don't want to just know that, you know, Christ is love the end. Because if these are Christ-like, we want to understand that. Right? We want to know the Lord Jesus as he is. 
So God is a God of vengeance. That's true. That's right. And it should be that way. And so is Christ. But the question is, what does that mean for us? Should we pray for the destruction of our enemies? And that's what we're going to be considering in our next class. <laughs>